Hi, I'm Sue Friedman, and this presentation is participating in clinical trials for people with inherited mutations. Why, when, and how? And before we get started, I have no conflicts to disclose. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. I'm Sue Friedman. Um, I'm executive director and founder of Force. And I came to this position as many advocates do through my own diagnosis with breast cancer and my own personal experience. 25 years ago, at the age of 33, I was diagnosed out of the blue with breast cancer. And I could say a lot more about that, but this presentation really isn't about that journey. But I wanna talk about advances um, in research. Um, I bring up my advocacy experience to make the point that over the last two decades, I've had the privilege of seeing many exciting advances um, in research that have resulted in changes in guidelines and changes to cancer care. When I was first diagnosed and all through treatment, I had to make decisions about what to do for future cancer risk. I was presented with a set of options, but I didn't stop to think much about where those options came from. I recall being really frustrated by the gaps in knowledge. For example, genetic testing was pretty new back in 1998, and there wasn't much in the way of guidelines for what I should do about my risk for future cancers. When you're making tough medical decisions, it's easy to take for granted the current standard of care options um, as common knowledge and to be frustrated by large gaps in the information that we know and what we don't know. But 20 years later since my diagnosis, we know so much more than we did then when I was first diagnosed with cancer and when I first learned that I had an inherited mutation. So when we take a step back, you know, we can see that long winding road, uh, the necessary process of research that got us here. The very things that we take for granted today are really the results of research over a very long period of time. And again, when I was first diagnosed early in 1996 and then after a recurrence, I completed my treatment in 1998. I started FORCE in 1999. It was really only then that I started to pay attention to the advances in cancer research and cancer care. So just allow me a brief moment to just get a little nostalgic and point out some of the advances that I've had the privilege of seeing become part of care over the last two decades. For example, in genetics, back when I um, had genetic testing, the test was just really for BRCA1 and 2, and it was really quite expensive. But because of research, testing is now more affordable. The labs have the ability to test for many mutations and many genes at the same time. And this has led to the discovery of new genes linked to cancer risk. And this has led to better cancer risk estimates and better um, options for people with inherited mutations since I was first tested. Screening and prevention have improved. The advent of MRI as part of screening for um, breast cancer, as part of um, screening now for um, pancreatic cancer, along with esophageal ultrasound for pancreatic cancer screening. Um, the research has led us to start looking at fallopian tubes as the origin of a ovarian cancer, and that's leading us to more research and improvements in, um, in mastectomy and reconstruction have led to better aesthetic outcomes for people making those decisions. Most of this was really in the experimental phase when I was first diagnosed. And you know, in the realm of cancer treatment, things like sentinel node mapping and biopsy allow surgeons to um, do less invasive surgeries and less risk for lymphedema the advent of new targeted therapies and looking at tumors for tumor bar biomarkers has really led to improvements and expansion in options for treatment. Things like minimally invasive surgery and robotic surgery have you know, allowed us to have surgery with smaller incisions and um, quicker, um, quicker recoveries. And um, advances in immunotherapy, for example, have been really exciting and have changed how we treat cancers. And all of this has really exploded since the time that I first started paying attention to cancer treatment. If you've ever looked at the guidelines for your situation or condition or wondered why there weren't guidelines for your situation or your inherited mutation, it all goes back to research. Guidelines are made using evidence and the evidence comes from research. Lack of research evidence means lack of guidelines. 
As research is completed and new therapies or procedures are found to be more effective or less toxic than prior therapies, these advances lead to changes in the guidelines. So that's the brass ring of research is being able to change guidelines and help people make decisions about their care. We right now are the beneficiaries of the research efforts and the volunteers who participated before us. And likewise, we leave the legacy of our research participation today to future generations. And when you think about it, it's our community, the hereditary cancer community, with the risk we share with our relatives, we face a disproportionate cancer burden. We, those of us in the hereditary cancer community, have so much at stake and so much to gain by participating in research. So it's not your fault if you're not participating in research studies. We often hear that many, we often hear of the many reasons in the research about why patients are not participating in research. But you know, that isn't the whole story. Patients can't participate in research studies they don't know about. A recent publication in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute found that patients who are offered clinical trials from their doctors often do enroll. And it's your right to know about all of your treatment options, including clinical trials. One of the most well-known guideline bodies that develop guidelines for cancer care, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, also known as NCCN, includes a statement in every treatment guideline that they publish, which says, NCCN believes the best management for any patient with cancer is a clinical trial. And they really encourage clinical trial participation. Healthcare professionals, however, are not always aware of clinical trials outside of their institution. So where you seek your care may really impact whether or not you hear about or are invited to participate in a clinical trial. And there are reasons why healthcare professionals may not offer you or other patients clinical trials. They may not be, as I said before, aware of studies outside of their facility. And there may be barriers to them referring people to other facilities outside their own institution. And you know, your doctor or oncologist may feel legitimately that there are better options than clinical trials for your situation. However, one of the things that we hear a lot, and it's alarming the number of times we hear this, is patients reporting that their oncologists talk to them about clinical trials only as a last resort. And that's not true. Research studies are available for all stages of cancer. And the research um, is often designed not to be a last resort. So even though you can see the myth echoed in some of these quotes, and these were real quotes by people who completed a survey for us, and that really reflects this idea that um, doctors, some doctors are telling patients that clinical trials are only available when there are no options left, or only best when there are no options left. But in fact, there are some studies that you might become ineligible for once you have certain types of treatment. So waiting until there's no more options isn't always the best strategy for participating in clinical trials. So this is really an, um, a false narrative that we'd like to change and raise awareness that you know, clinical trials are not only um, there for last resort. And studies compete for patients. So if you think about clinical trials or research studies as puzzles, and you think about us, the community and patients as puzzle pieces, um, people with an inherited mutation who have cancer, we make up a subset of the larger cancer community. And so, you know, if you're looking at a clinical trial that's enrolling people with all sorts of, um, let's say it's pancreatic cancer, and it's open to anyone with pancreatic cancer of a particular stage, whether they have a mutation or not. And you're looking at that pool of patients. So let's say that the patients, the puzzle pieces with, um, with the DNA on them, um, stand for a patient with an inherited mutation. And let's say that that puzzle on the left is a clinical trial and it is only enrolling people with that certain um, inherited mutation. 
think about it. If that person with the inherited mutation ends up in that larger study that's open to people of all sorts with or without mutations, then they may not be available to, you know, they may be that person that's uniquely qualified to complete that study on the left. But if they end up in the um, more general study, then there may not be patients available to complete the study on the left, which is for people with inherited mutations. So if you have an inherited mutation, you may be uniquely qualified to be the person who completes that study that was designed for people with inherited mutations. And then that pool of other patients um, who would qualify for the wider or larger study could also complete the study on the right. And this way we can get both studies completed. The risk is that, um, you know, in enrolling for a study, if the study can't be completed, if they're lacking that one patient, studies have, are at risk of closing down. And studies that close down early, they don't get completed. And they can't go on to be guideline changes. So it's really important, especially for our community, to be able to do whatever we can to enroll in research studies. Um, that are trying to um, recruit people with inherited mutations. And if we can't complete these studies, the next time someone has a really great idea for a treatment or prevention for someone with an inherited mutation, we don't want them to say that community is too hard to enroll people into. Unfortunately, research resources and matching tools and programs and um, uh, facilitators to clinical trial enrollment aren't often designed with the hereditary community in mind. Um, and so it's up to us as members of the hereditary community, those from this community to try and fill in the gaps and look for studies that we may be uniquely qualified to enroll in. So when should you consider enrolling in a research study? Um, I wanted to take a moment to emphasize yet again that research studies are not exclusively for people with no other options. There are studies enrolling patients throughout the cycle of care. So this is a screenshot of FORCES resource, our research search and enroll tool. And you can see I have um, a QR code in the um, lower right so that you can easily make it to the um, website and bookmark it in case you wanna take a look at it. And we'll talk more about this resource in a minute. But for the purpose of this slide, I wanted to point out that there are clinical trials across the entire spectrum of care. We have studies for high-risk screening and prevention, as well as treatment studies, um, quality of life studies that are enrolling people both who have never had cancer and people in treatment, long-term survivors. Um, so regardless of where you are in your cancer experience, there may be studies enrolling people like you. And as I mentioned before, some clinical trials are only open to people who have not had certain types of treatment or you know, certain interventions or prevention. For example, neoadjuvant treatment studies, those are studies that are looking at people who haven't had surgery to remove the tumor yet. So if you're interested in a study like that, it's important to know about that study before you have surgery to remove your tumor. If you're interested in learning about treatment clinical trials, it's important to gather that clinical trial option or all your options before you start treatment. Sometimes in the case of a fast growing cancer, you may not have that option, but many treatment decisions can wait until you've considered all your options, including clinical trials. And when you're searching for studies, it's important to check the eligibility and exclusion criteria, which I've listed some examples here. Um, these will tell you who qualifies for um, enrollment in a study, including if a prior treatment may make you ineligible for a study. So how do you find studies enrolling people with inherited mutations? Let's face it, it can be pretty hard. This is a screenshot from, um, you know, with inclusion criteria from um, a website known as clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and we had presented, we had done a focus group asking people like, can you tell, um, here's the eligibility criteria. Can you tell if you're eligible for this study? And you, know, you can see what that respondent said. I have to have a medical degree to understand whether or not I'm eligible for a trial. Um, the information on many of the sites um, with clinical, about clinical trials 
are full of jargon. They're often technical and it can be really hard for you at a glance to determine, am I eligible for this or not? Am I interested in it, um, in this or not? So that's why we've tried to simplify it at FORCE for you. Um, this is our FORCE featured research page. Again, I've included a QR code and a quick link so that you can go there and bookmark it as well. On our featured research page, we've compiled many screening, prevention, quality of life and treatment studies specifically of interest to people with inherited mutations. We also help promote these studies um, and other studies, including interviews and research registries that often just require providing information or filling out surveys or participating in focus groups or phone interviews. These studies can also be really important because they can help researchers understand um, the medical preferences among the hereditary cancer community so that they can design better um, studies and better interventions for us. And so if you peruse our featured research study um, page, you can look at all the studies or you can um, click on search now and do a search for particular studies based on the type of cancer, um, the type of study and other features. So we'll take a little quicker dive into that. So when you click search now, it takes you to a page where you can choose between treatment, prevention, detection and risk, quality of life and well-being and surveys, registries and interviews. And each of these is a portal to the studies that we've compiled in those categories. So the treatment studies allow you to search for studies by cancer stage, um, the type of cancer and other factors, including things like biomarkers, um, whether or not the cancer is newly diagnosed or recurrent, those sorts of things. Um, and then our prevention, detection, and risk um, studies are organized by cancer type. Um, and our quality of life studies are also organized by cancer type or no cancer, um, as well as topics or conditions like lymphedema, neuropathy, memory, weight management, that sort of thing. So you can find studies more easily that you're looking for. And this is an example um, from two of the searches. One would be the, our colorectal cancer treatment. You can see that you can choose stage and biomarker. Um, likewise, on the ovarian cancer um, treatment search, you can choose from newly diagnosed or recurrent, and then a series of biomarkers. And you can always put in a keyword search like platinum resistant. Um, for example, if you're looking for a deeper dive um, into a um, into you know a biomarker or your um, particular situation. And just you know a quick look at prevention and um, detection risk and quality of life. Um, these are really made to be simple search tools. Um, and so this is the screenshot of what you see when you click on those and what your options are for searching for studies. And then our results, when you click the search button, our tool searches two, two separate databases for the research study. So at the top, you'll see the search results of studies that we've compiled and put in our database. So these are studies that we've chosen to be somewhat high priority. Um, we put them in plain language and we'll take a deeper dive so you can see what that looks like. But we provide a little bit more plain language information about those studies. We also return searches from the large clinical um, the large clinical trial site that I mentioned before, clinicaltrials.gov. This is a comprehensive database maintained by the United States National Institutes of Health. Um, it's huge and it's a valuable resource. It has, it's you know, much more complete than our research tool or any other research tool. Um, it's massive. But we want people who are interested in participating in research to know about all of their options. So, you know, we don't just want to return um, results from our database. We want people to see what else may be available there because we can't include all of the studies that are out there in our database. Um, it's not quite as user friendly as um, as our featured research studies are. Um, and you'll be able to see that in a minute. So what happens when you click on more information on one of the studies that is in our database? We'll take you through that. 
This is an example of one of the studies. This is a, um, a screening study for prostate cancer in high-risk men that we feature um, in our featured research um, database. And we'll go through some of the features of these study details. First, we try and put in as plain language as possible about the study, what it is about, what they're trying, what the researchers are trying to learn. We also put who's eligible to enroll and we use a little bit of a visual cue, it's in the green box and we try and be as specific as possible, especially if it's a study enrolling people with inherited mutations because we want you to be able to see at a glance if you might be eligible or not. And then in the red box, we put who's not eligible. And you know we shorten it, there's usually a lot more eligibility and ineligibility. And you might have to um, take a deeper dive and go to clinicaltrials.gov or call the study coordinator, which we'll talk about in a minute, to see if you really are specifically um, eligible. But we want you to be able to see at a glance, is this a study that I'm interested in or not? We also incorporate a hover over glossary. So you can see that um, the, um, the letters PSA are highlighted. And um, when you hover over PSA, it gives you um, a definition of what that is from our database so that you don't have to navigate off the page um, to understand some of the jargon. We also provide the name and contact information for the study coordinator. This is really important because these are the people who know most about the study and will be able to give you more details so that you don't have to necessarily sort through clinicaltrials.gov um, or some other technical site to see if you actually are ineligible and how are eligible and how you can enroll. We do link to the clinicaltrials.gov identifier. Not all studies have a number, but a lot of the larger clinical trials do have a number assigned by clinicaltrials.gov. So if you see that number in our database, you can click on that and it will take you to the actual listing for the study in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and this is what that same study looks like in clinicaltrials.gov. It has a lot more detail. It's organized in a different way. It's not quite as user-friendly. Um, certainly there aren't the visual cues there, but there is a lot more detail and it is really um, valuable to go visit the study um, site uh, or the study listing on clinicaltrials.gov. We also compiled some tips to help you in your search for studies. And we have trained volunteers through our peer navigation program who can help you find clinical trials that are enrolling people like you in case you need additional assistance. So what should you do once you find a study? One of the first things that would be helpful is gather as much information as you can about your diagnosis and situation. So if you can get access to your electronic health records or maybe a printed version of your health records, that is always helpful. Um, looking for things like your pathology, your stage, any lab test results, any genetic test results. Um, any additional biomarker like tumor test results, those are helpful to have. And what treatments you've already received because that can help you determine if you're eligible for a study or not. And then remember this feature, the study coordinator. We are huge advocates of having people contact the study coordinator. That's why we list it and we make their information prominent because these are the best people to tell you next steps and help um, you know, navigate you through the system because sometimes it can be complicated. If you have to change health systems, go to a different hospital, um, trying to figure out how, you know, how to get enrolled as a patient there. Um, so the study um, contact is often that person who can help you do that. And just a few quotes to really um, emphasize that. This was from, um, this was taken from actual um, people who used our um, who um, used our research tool, um, just with some quotes about how, um, how helpful study coordinators have been, telling people if they qualified for the study, helping them get their medical records so that they can um, you know, get um, into the study as soon as possible. Um, we had a situation where someone um, you know, couldn't find a study in an area close to them, a treatment study, um, and they didn't really wanna travel or they weren't in a, in a situation to travel, but when they contacted the study coordinator, they found out that a 
study site was opening right near them the following month, which is incredible. So um, again, really helpful people. Um, and sometimes, I mean, the study quarter may tell you something that makes you understand that maybe this study isn't right for you. So it's not only about enrolling you in the study, it's helping match people um, to studies that they would be interested in. And then ask questions when you talk to the study coordinator um, and anyone else associated with the study team, um, if the study is right for you. So, you know, understanding what does the study entail? How long will they follow me up for? What extra visits will I need? Will my insurance cover it? These are all um, great questions to um, ask so that you can make a decision based on, you know, seeing the big picture about the clinical trial. And then once you've done that, talk to your doctor. Even if you end up going to another facility with a different doctor, it's really important to talk to your current healthcare team to consider all your options and make the decision that's best for you. So I wanna just talk a little bit about clinical trial safety um, because I know this is really important. People are, are concerned about, and you know, we've heard people that express concern about are clinical trials safe? There are a lot of safety features that are part of clinical research, especially in the United States. So there are um, external boards that look over the study design and monitor the study as it's being conducted to make sure that the study is safe with your safety in mind. So institutional review boards, um, are, you know, they're usually at hospitals, um, cancer centers, academic institutions. They include a lot of different stakeholders, um, physicians, um, and, and oftentimes patient represent, representatives as, as well. And their role is to make sure that the study design is ethical, that participant risks are minimized, that the rights and welfare of study participants are protected, and also to look over that informed consent form, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, to make sure that you have a really good sense of what you're um, enrolling into um, and that you can understand if the study is right for you. The Data Safety Monitoring Board oversees the study as it's being conducted to make sure that um, there's no harm, um, undue harm that um, you know, may be evident that may be happening to um, people who are participating. So they watch really closely. Um, both the DSMB or the Data Safety Monitoring Board and the Institutional Review Board, the IRB, um, have may have physicians, scientists, ethicists, statistical um, experts, and patient advocates. And all the members on both of those boards are independent from the research team. You have a right to know what you're consenting for. So um, it's really important with research to know that you'll get an informed consent that will list the study description, the risks, your other options, um, the design of the study, what is entailed in the study, the name of the researcher in charge of the study, um, and um, you know, really emphasize the fact that you can elect to participate or you can elect not to. You can decide not to consent for a research study and not um, enroll in it. Or you can be in a study and you have the right to withdraw your consent and decide that you don't want to participate in the study any further. Um, and that's really important. Um, and it, it's um, an informed consent will also tell you that you have the right not to participate in a study and that should not affect the care that you've received, um, the level of care you receive from your healthcare professionals. I just also want to address um, something really important and that is clinical trials don't withhold treatment. Placebos or sugar pills are used in addition to standard of care or when there is no standard of care. So for example, let's say that you've been diagnosed with cancer and the standard of care is chemotherapy. A study may be designed to look at chemotherapy plus an experimental drug or chemotherapy, standard of care chemotherapy plus a sugar pill, for example. So let's say that it's a study and there's two study groups. One study group may have standard of care chemotherapy plus the experimental drug, and the other group may have standard of care chemotherapy plus a placebo. 
that's really important for you to know um, that you know you will not have treatment withheld, um, and it's not like you wouldn't be treated if you were in a placebo group. If they're standard of care, you will at least get standard of care. In situations where there is no standard of care, then you may be given a placebo versus an experimental drug. And I do wanna mention clinical trial participants are monitored very closely for cancer progression or any adverse events. Um, and that would be, you know, either your cancer is getting worse or you've had a serious side effect. And then um, the studies have really outlines of what happens next and what your options may be. So I'm just gonna go through a few um, quick examples of studies enrolling people with inherited mutation. So these are some studies that are in our featured research database. And for each one, I've included a QR code so that you can find them easily and bookmark the page. Um, and then remember that we also have volunteers who can help you find studies enrolling people like you. So these are some prevention and detection studies. And I just chose some to give you a sense of the range of studies that we have um, in our database and the range of research studies that are available for people with inherited mutations. So ROC is an ovarian cancer prevention study looking at um, removal of the fallopian tubes with delayed oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries delayed in people with BRCA1 mutations. And the study on the right was that prostate cancer screening study that I showed you before that's open to men with a really broad range of different types of mutations. We have some pancreatic um, cancer detection studies that are in our database. Um, and you know, some are for people with BRCA1 and 2, PALB2, ATM mutations. Um, the study on the right you can see um, are for people with a family history of pancreatic cancer um, and also people with mutations in any number of different um, genes. So um, also again, worth checking out. And just a couple of ovarian cancer screening studies as well um, that you might be interested in participating in. We also have treatment studies. Um, and again, we really try and pull out the treatment studies that are going to be of high interest to people with inherited mutations. So maybe looking at targeted therapies or talking uh, or looking at people with certain biomarkers that may be common in someone with an inherited mutation. And these are two pancreatic cancer treatment studies. Um, and on the left, a colorectal cancer treatment study. Um, and on the right, an endometrial cancer treatment study that may be, again, of interest to people who are high risk um, or who have inherited mutations that um, cause their cancer. These are treatment studies, not high risk, sorry. And then we do have some quality of life studies in there too. The one on the left is a diet and exercise intervention for survivors. The one on the right is a memory um, study looking at um, women who have had early menopause um, due to risk removal, risk producing removal of their um, ovaries and fallopian tubes. And then I wanna make a shout out to um, our um, academic um, sponsor and partner of this conference, um, Vassar Cancer Center and their research registry, um, and hope that everybody at this conference will consider participating um, and enrolling in their research registry. There are other ways that you can advance research, and that is participating in the research design and development, and you don't have to have a scientific background to do that. Um, the Forest Research Advocate Training Program, this is a program for volunteers who want to be more involved in research um, study design. Um, this is a self-paced online program, um, and, um, you know, you can enroll, and actually, we, I think we have a session on participating um, as a volunteer for Forest um, later in the conference. And just some quotes from some of our FRAT advocates. Most people find it really rewarding. And again, you don't have to have a scientific background to participate. So before closing, I just wanted to give you a slide with some additional clinical trial resources for you. And we'll also have this in the resource section um, of this session. I really appreciate your time and interest and encourage you to check out more about Forest.